thank you for being here tonight, man. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I really want to thank the Loudoun County Public Library for this wonderful opportunity to talk about a uh, topic that I'm real. I've always been really excited about, and um, I just think it's something that um, more people should know about um, because it's a critical topic as we go forward uh, with food security. And so that's why I'm really grateful for the opportunity here. Um, I just want to say I'm not an expert on wine or even grapes, actually. Uh, and I've invited people to watch this who know far more than I do about that. But uh, I came to this from the interest in the crop wild relatives. So, um, and that got, and then the project was on the grapes. So uh, I threw myself into it. And actually, it happened that this is kind of what I did during COVID because uh, the uh, workshop that I was working on with Nature Serve got postponed two times. So it gave me a lot of time to go back and, uh, reorganize it over and over and just keep learning, which is what I love to do. Okay, so what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, what are the crop, what are crop wild relatives? Why are they important? What is plant domestication? Conservation of the wild relatives of our crops, the cultivated grape, Vitus vinifera, and its crop wild relatives, and a workshop on the conservation of the native grapes of North America that was held at Oak Spring Garden, which is in Upperville, this past November. And then um, just a little bit about what are some of our local crop wild relatives that we might want to be aware of. So I just want to go over these two concepts because they're kind of fuzzy for a lot of us. And um, I will talk about them later, but I just before we even get into it, in case I mention them on your left, you see a graft and that is actually 2 distinct individuals um, joined together. And if you have an apple tree, you'll be familiar with this. A lot of our fruit trees are grafted and many of our grapes are grafted. So that's what that is. Um, very different from that is a hybrid, which you also may have learned about in the past. But just to kind of refresh your memory, you have two individuals here who are bred together, and that is called a hybrid. And um, yeah, please do put your questions in the chat as we go forward. So what are crop wild relatives? Um, so crop wild relatives are the relatives of our crop plants. All crop plants have these. Um, and these are the uh, wild plants that hold the genes that are important for resistance to various things that uh, affect our crops. They're very important for breeding. They're the wild plant species that are closely related to a crop species. So here we have a few examples. Now, to um, talk a little bit more about crop, uh, crop wild relatives, I need to go into plant domestication. And to talk about plant domestication, I'm going to start off with this slide pointing out that I think we know that our crops didn't always look like this, but I'm not sure if all of us really know where the crops came from. So that's when we get into plant domestication. So domestication should be thought of as just a subset of the evolutionary process that affects all organisms. So it's a complex evolutionary process whereby a population, and in this case, we're talking about a population of plants, adapts genetically to environments created by human disturbance and cultivation. Now, um, we think of domestication as occurring starting around 10,000 years ago. Scientists um, continue to do research on that and um, and I think it's always being pushed back and different crops are dom domesticated at different times, but it's kind of an easy number to keep in our heads around 10,000 years ago um, is uh, when this transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture took place. And um, it's really important that we understand that it's it wasn't like a decision, like, let's give up hunting and gathering and go to agriculture. This is an evolutionary process where the plants and even the humans were changed in almost a symbiotic relationship. Because when humans disturb um, the environment around them, which just means anything we do, um, that creates new opportunities for plants. 
Okay, so moving on from that, um, just to remind you about natural selection in general, this is, of course, um, a picture of Darwin's um, finches that he did a study on. And so, of course, by natural selection, um, they, uh, they had varied, they, they uh, radiated into different groups according to like the kinds of seeds that they ate or whatever else they ate. So we need to think of what we do as being very similar to that. So here, for example, is a wild mustard plant. And as you may know, many of uh, the wild mustard plant is the ancestor of a lot of different things that we eat. And it depends which part of the, must, uh, the plant that we um, focused on um, uh, cultivating and domesticating. Um, so I call this, this is, I call this also natural selection. You can call it artificial selection and some people do because it's done by humans. But if you believe as I do that humans are actually part of the natural world, um, I think of this as actually a type of natural selection. So either way is fine. And um, going further with this idea of us just being part of nature, surprisingly, other animals have also um, caused changes in plants that have led them towards domestication. And um, the uh, and there's something in the um, um, I have a WordPress site where I've put some links that you can look at later, and you can. Um, you, you can see some articles about this if, if you want to go into this, because I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. But surprisingly, it turns out that um, some of these ancient megafauna that died out, of course, in the Pleistocene, um, they were the ones that were dispersing some of our um, plants with large seeds. So I won't say any more about that, but that's another fascinating topic. And then, you know, there's other animal farmers, such as the ants, of course, who uh, the leaf cutter ants who take the leaves down into their um, nests and uh, grow fungi on them to feed their offspring. So uh, there's trade offs to domestication. There's trade offs to everything that happens. Um, and in this case, one of them is that the domesticated crop has less genetic diversity than its ancestor or its relatives. So it's less resi resilient to drought, storms, cold, heat, pests, and pathogens, all the things that really could happen um, to a plant. Um, and that's because instead of living out in the wild where it's subject to these stresses and then has, and the ones who um, can survive these stresses live and pass on their genes, Instead, the domesticated crops are brought into our gardens and fields where we basically sort of baby them. You know, we nurture them. Um, we keep the weeds away from them so that we are selecting them for traits that we like, but they're not necessarily the traits that are going to allow them to be resilient to um, all the pressures that nature's going to throw at them. Okay, so speaking of domestication, um, it was really exciting. Two weeks ago, um, uh, new research came out in science about um, domestication of Vitis vinifera. Now, Vitis vinifera is the domesticated wine grape. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that name, Vitis vinifera, in a minute. But um, we thought for a long time, or it was thought, that the uh, wine grape arose in Georgia. And here's a map down here where you can see that. Um, recently, they've discovered that this domestication probably happened twice independently in places that were about 600 miles apart um, around uh, 11,000 years ago. And those places were Georgia and the Eastern Mediterranean. Interestingly, since we're going to be talking about wild grapes, um, the grapevine from the Eastern Mediterranean then was carried into Europe and bred with, hybridized with um, the wild European species. And that is what produced the Vitis vinifera, which produces most of the wine that we're familiar with today. Okay, let's just talk a little bit about this in case anybody's um, forgotten their biology. So we're just gonna talk about genus and species. Um, and uh, there's one genus that we're going to talk about, which is Vitus, the grapevines. There's about 65 or 70 Vitus worldwide, so about 65 or 70 grapevine species. 
Now there's like 25 or so in North America, and that's what we're mostly gonna focus on. So here you have the species um, underneath, Vitis vinifera is the domesticated crop. That's the only domesticated crop that really came out of uh, this genus, uh, for the most part. And there's a few little exceptions. Um, so most of the wine or grapes or raisins that you eat or drink are probably from cultivars of this one species. And as we know, there are many, many, many cultivars, we call them, which are the different uh, kinds of wine that you can drink, like um, Cabernet Sauvignon would be a cultivar. So that is a cultivar of the domesticated crop. But what we're going to talk about today is something different. These are different species in the genus. And here I just put uh, five of the rather well-known ones that are in North America. And um, then there's many species in Asia as well. And some of them are crop wild relatives that are very important as well. And are there any, Jeremy, are there any, um, uh, things that people are not understanding about that slide. So we had one quick question. Um, do you consider domestication as genetic modification? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, it is a kind of genetic modification. I mean, the genes are actually modified. They're, they're actually changed because a domesticated plant is genetically separate from its relatives. That's one of the definitions of being a domesticated plant. Um, so I think I sort of take the view that this is all sort of a continuum, but I know people have very strong feelings about this, so I probably won't get into that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, a little bit more about Vitus, the genus. Um, so again, they're around, um, it depends who you talk to, around 60 species, and um, here, are again some of the these two on top are the um, two of the American species, the native Native American species, and then over here, actually, this is sort of interesting because down here we have Vitis vinifera, um, and above it we have Vitis vinifera subspecies Sylvestris. Sylvestris means wild, um, and so this is actually the progenitor of the direct progenitor of the Vitus vinifera, which is now subspecies vinifera, if you wanted to go into detail. Okay, um, interestingly, it's kind of fun to talk about grapes because um, this was probably the first successful use of crop wild relatives to, um, to save a crop. So you may be familiar with the, um, with the phylloxera crisis that happened in Europe in the late 1800s. And so uh, phylloxera are these little insects. They're like aphids, and this is a root. So this is a vitus vinifera root. And these are little phylloxera insects sucking all of the juices out of it and basically killing it. And um, what they had in France and other European countries was widespread, widespread, loss of their vines. It was almost the collapse of the entire industry. Um, there's, uh, you can read that it was between two thirds and nine tenths of the vines were lost. Now this um, phylloxera did originally come from North America too, you know. So anyway, where I'm going with this is that it's the North American vines that saved this crop. But it's also the Phylloxera had originally come from North America because botanists and viticulturalists and people who like plants were always exchanging plants back and forth, um, you know, when new places were discovered. Uh, so there was a lot of travel of plants back and forth. Um, and then what you see on the right is the same phylloxera, but attacking the um, North American species. And so what happens usually here is that they attack the leaves and they form these galls, but it doesn't kill the plant. So um, we would say the plant has resistance to, to that. Um, so what they did is um, they found three, after trying many, many, many different things, 
um, they found three American species, actually really two to start with, that served as rootstock for the European vines. So now we're going to talk about grafting again. So this is, of course, uh, the rootstock down here. And let's see here. Oops, okay, rootstock down here, scion above, we call it, we just call this the scion. Um, so with the phylloxera crisis, you don't have to look at, let me go back one. Uh, what the, with the phylloxera crisis, um, they found two um, North American species, Vitus riparia and Vitus rupestris, that had resistance to the phylloxera because phylloxera was a North American insect. And so what they did from then on is they grafted the two together. So they would have the European vine up here and they would have the North American rootstock down here. This is done till this day. And to this day, most of the rootstock, most, I'm sorry, most of the wine that you might drink comes from grapes that are bred on North American rootstock. These three species. This species here is now called Vitus berlandieri. But these three species basically are bred together and hybridized together, and they form all of the rootstock worldwide for the wine industry in almost all cases. There's a few little exceptions. And an interesting thing, and this is where it gets fascinating and also confusing with grapes um, and other woody plants. Um, Along with that happening down here, this hybridization down here for the rootstock, we have hybridization that forms the scion. So this is a Vitus vinifera grape, that's our domesticated grape, but the cultivar, which is in quotes, is called chambersan. And that's one of our French American hybrids, they call it. Now, that chambersan has these um, five American species uh, bred with the Vitus vinifera to form this grape. So this is a very complicated plant that you're looking at right here and represents um, a lot of different species coming together. You know, one of the interesting things is that um, plants hybridize in the wild um, rampantly um, and uh, grapes particularly are particularly known for hybridizing in the wild. So this is not something artificial at all. And uh, pr plants even um, graft in the wild. There are pictures you can find on the internet of uh, plants forming natural grafts. So these are actually just uh, building on two natural things that happen. Um, there's one other thing I want to say about rootstock. Well, so our rootstock diversity is very narrow, and we're going to get back um, to that in a minute. So let's jump to why do we need crop wild relatives? Well, we just saw one example, right? Um, it saved the European wine industry. So that's that's a pretty good use of crop wild relatives right there. But here's just another um, slide with some examples of um, some of the resistances and things that the um, wild plants have that they confer on the crops. Now, interesting, um, I actually grow this, this um, hazelnut, I, we call it hazelnut too. So many of you, some of you might even grow this um, wild species in your yard. So I'll just let you look at that. Uh, any more questions, Jeremy? No more at the moment. Okay. Um, so grape breeding has always relied on native grapes um, and continues to do so. Um, okay, more about why do we need crop, crop wild relatives, particularly of the grape? So this is kind of a fun thing that came out um, in N this NPR, um, the salt. Um, article a few years ago. So we drink basically the same wine varietals as ancient Romans, and that's not so great. And um, that means because it's had very little diversity or change. And of course, um, with woody plants like uh, grapevines, you're often growing clones. And so then you really don't have any uh, genetic variation because you're just um, cutting off pieces of the same vine and, and using it generation after generation. Um, but anyway, so our uh, 
our wine grapes have changed very little for the last 2000 years. And so you can imagine that that would mean they probably are not um, up to resisting some of the pressures that we have from pathogens and climate change and things like that. And here's a really close to home example. Um, this came out a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you saw this. Many of you may know this fellow. This is Doug Fabioli of Fabioli Vineyards in Luckett's. And um, we know we had a really warm winter and um, this is a real problem for people who are growing things like wine grapes because um, the vines need to acclimate themselves. Um, and then if they flower too soon, of course, you, you might lose that flower in the frost and, um, and not get any fruit and it's really a problem. So um, that's really a major reason that we wanna look for locally adapted vines and then even vines adapted to maybe other areas. And there's active research going on in this area of how to get vines that, um, how to grow vines that will um, withstand these, these climatic extremes and so forth. Okay, and a couple more just little threats to uh, wine grapes that we have to be aware of and that crop wild relatives are good at helping with is uh, downy mildew is a major um, fungal pathogen that uh, wine growers in our area have, area have to face, as is powdery mildew. And there's many, many others. Those two um, I've just heard about a lot. So. That's the kind of thing where you want to look for resistance in some of our local species, and that is what the breeders do. And uh, Vitus riparia, which is a very common vine and is in our area and is very widespread in the United States, um, is being studied quite a bit for cold hardiness. And uh, ironically, with climate change happening, not only do we have to worry about warmth and drought and things like that, but we, uh, cold hardiness is actually a greater problem um, because of this very long, complicated thing that I don't exactly understand about acc acclimatizing of the crops. Okay, um, now, what are some of these threats or why are we worried about our crop wild relatives? Well, we can see here's a few examples of um, crop wild relatives that, that are threatened. And um, this is the Okeechobee gourd, which is one of the um, crop wild relatives of our pumpkins, of course, um, sunflower. This um, prunus would be a crop wild relative of many of our domesticated prunus. That means our cherries and plums and peaches and apricots. So, um, this is just a very small example of all of the of, of the threats that many of our crop wild relatives uh, undergo. And um, Vitus rupestris, um, which I may have mentioned earlier, it's one of the three North American species that was used as rootstocks when it saved the European grape industry. Um, this is kind of an interesting example of something that is declining in range. And this is an example of, uh, or this is an article that was written in 2003, looking at where grapes had been found um, in the last century versus, I think she was going back in like 1997 and seeing where they still were. And there was a decline. And um, one of the main ways that uh, botanists do this work is to go through herbarium specimens. And so this is like from 1889, I think, and collected by Munson actually, who's a very famous um, person in the viticulture industry, um, characterized a lot of grapes. Uh, so anyway, this was the Vitus rupestris, rupestris collected by him. So, you know, they, a botanist would go back and see if, it, if a population was still growing in this area where um, where Munson collected it uh, over a century ago. So, you know, why are wild plants threatened? Not just crop wild relatives, but plants in general. Um, we know what biodiversity in general is threatened. And I think we always have to just come back to, we do have a growing population. Um, we, are, we have an impact on the planet. Just, you know, every single person does. That's just the way it is. And, our, our homes and the change in the landscape over time and the roads that we build and everything else. It just all takes habitat away. And um, 
that's just something for us to be aware of. So getting back to grapes, um, grapes are just fun in a lot of ways to think about this with crop wild relatives, because in this case, we may already be familiar with hybrids that are bred from crop wild relatives. So, of course, we know about grape jelly and grape juice, and this is the Concord grape. And the Concord grape is a cross. Um, it's a cross that came, er, so originally there was, here's Vitus vinifera. This is our domesticated crop. Over here is Vitus labrusca. That's a Native American species. They crossed sometime in the wild. Um, I'm told that this happened a lot because the colonists, the European colonists kept coming over and bringing uh, wines, Vitus vinifera, I mean, vines, Vitus vinifera with them and trying to grow them in America to make wine and it failed repeatedly. But because the wines were, because the vines were in the landscape, uh, the pollen from the vines um, pollinated some of the wild plants and that's how we got some of the very early crosses. It just happened in nature, more or less. So then this cross was taken with um, another Vitus labrusca plant. And this gives us our Concord, which is the native grape, native sort of ish grape that um, most people may be familiar with. And there's uh, Concord grapes that you can buy and a Concord wine. And so you can see it's three quarters native, Ameri uh, na native American grape and one quarter of Vitus vinifera. We had a question, how could you, could you recognize a native wild grape between a non-native wild grape? Are there any, like, I guess, visually looking at them? Is there an easy way to tell? So, yeah, the native wild grapes are much smaller, at least in my experience. The native wild grapes are almost all, you know, the kind you sort of see in your backyard or out in the woods. Um, the uh, domesticated grape is larger, and that's usually what you see with domesticated plants. That's one of the things that um, early farmers selected for was a plant, a berry that would be bigger um, as well as sweeter. Uh, but just to go a little bit further with that question, it's um, it's really hard to identify grapes, though. So, so I actually cannot look at a grape in the wild and know which one I'm looking at. They're they vary a lot among themselves and, and I need an expert with me to, to tell me what's what. But yeah, it's usually easy to tell the difference between the domesticated and the wild just because the domesticated will be the much, um, not much larger grapes. Um, so this shows just how much um, vinifera content and wild native content is in a lot of the cultivars that people who are familiar with um, wines may be familiar with some of these cultivars. And I just think this is a really fun graph showing, um, I think they were surprised when they did this to find out how much native um, germplasm was in these various, uh, various cultivars. This, I linked to this article in that um, site. Oh, okay, and I would, um, a lot of my friends would be um, upset with me if I didn't mention how important wine grapes are for wildlife. That's not the topic of tonight, but they are very important. Um, I didn't have any information on that myself, but this is from Capital Naturalist blog, which uh, probably many people will be familiar with um, Alonso Alavugadas' work. And then this is just something I found on the um, internet uh, of a caterpillar on a grape. And um, actually the guy who wrote this blog um, was writing it because in Ohio, this is in Ohio, um, in Ohio, one of the grapes is actually considered an invasive. So you can have a native that's considered invasive and is outlawed. So, um, you know, th these are just sticky problems because some people can find grape vines um, annoying in various ways and 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 they're also useful in other ways so anyway okay so how do we conserve genetic resources plant genetic resources um and i just want to mention by the way that um we call them plant genetic resources because along with the crop wild relatives we also want to conserve all of the genetic variation that's in the crop
And that would be, for example, um, usually traditional farmers will be still farming crops that have a lot of diversity if they are not using the modern varieties. And so then there again, there's going to be a lot of resilience um, to various resistance to various things that are in those um, those different, we call them land races of, of the crop. So both of those are conserved, um, need to be conserved. I put this picture in, not because it's in North America, but because um, it's sort of an iconic picture that many of you may have seen. This, of course, is the um, seed bank that's in Norway that's been in many articles. So this is actually the uh, the seed bank where all the other seed banks send their material uh, as backup. And then, so this is illustrating here that we need to have ex situ conservation, meaning taking the plant out of the place and conserving it in a vault or something. And um, in situ means in the area in which it naturally grows. And this, um, we'll talk a little bit more about her in a minute, actually. Okay, so ex situ. So that's um, largely through our national plant germplasm system, and this is a USDA system. Um, the grapes are mostly um, housed at Geneva, New York, and Davis, California. And so their systems worldwide to conserve germplasm. Germplasm is another word for um, genetic material from plants. And here's one of the germplasm curators. This is the one from Davis, California. And so, um, for example, um, this is Vitis arizonica, which is very important for combating a certain um, insect that attacks grapevines in the southern United States. And so here she is collecting samples of that, either to study or to put it away in, um, in the germplasm bank um, to keep it. More of the sorts of things that would go on there. Okay, now conservation in situ is very important as well. Um, that's conservation of the place where the grape um, lives. So actually, we don't, we have very few examples of conservation areas set aside for crop wild relatives and there's none for grapes. But uh, there is one for cranberries and um, I think this is fascinating. This is not that far from us, actually. Um, so this is, these are wild cranberries that are conserved here um, in a uh, national forest site. And there's a wild chili botanical area in Arizona um, where the wild chili, which is the uh, relative of our domesticated chilies, is kept and um, it was pointed out to me the other day by somebody who's worked there that um, when you set aside a botanical area like this it's actually conserving not only the chili but um, the ancestors of uh, and relatives of other crops as well so setting aside that land is just key because um, you can be conserving all sorts of things Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about a workshop that um, happened kind of nearby here at a place called Oak Spring. And um, if you're not familiar with Oak Spring, you might want to uh, Google them. It's a very, it's a fascinating place, 700 acres um, that uh, is dedicated to the uh, horticultural, um, to celebrating the horticultural uh, tradition of bunny melon. And so they have a lot of wonderful, wonderful programs and including putting on conferences like that. So that was one of the partners of this workshop. And also NatureServe, which I'll talk about it a little bit more, USDA. And the other partner was the United States Botanic Garden, which you see a picture of here, which is in Washington, D.C. Um, and then here's a picture of us from at the workshop. So, um, the aim of the workshop was to see how well the grape wild, the crop wild relatives of the domesticated grape are conserved and what more needs to be done 
to conserve them, both in situ and ex situ. So, um, one piece of that is what nature serve does, and that's called conservation status assessments. They do these for, um. All plants and animals, actually all organisms in North America. If you've heard of the IUCN red list. That's an international organization that does a very similar thing ranks plants and animals on how threatened they are or whether they're doing just fine in their natural habitat. So, um, in this case, we were doing conservation status assessments for the 25 or so species and varieties of North American grapes. And um, I just picked this part out again because this is returning to Vitus repestris that I've mentioned a couple times, just because it's such an important um, component of our hybrid root stock that is needed worldwide. Um, and then what NatureServe does also is uh, ranks how, um, how well the, crop, the plant is doing um, in these various states, and it's it, it, this is ranked as a G3, which is not great. Uh, G5 would be very good. Uh, G1 would be critically imperiled. So G3 is, as you can see here, vulnerable. And um, then it ranks how it's doing at the states too. Um, if you ever want to go to, uh, you can look up any organism you want on nature, uh, North American organism on Nature Serve Explorer, and there's a picture of that right down here. Uh, just a picture of Vitus repestris since I've talked about it so much. This is in Missouri. Um, it's an interesting grape because it doesn't form a vine as much as a shrub. It uh, inhabits these sorts of areas where it's like called river scours. Um, and it's in decline partly because of changed hydrology in the eastern United States. So before you can do the assessments, the conservation status assessments, you have to know what um, what plants you're actually talking about. And that means that you have to do the taxonomy. This is the uh, world expert on Vitus taxonomy. This is June Wen from the Smithsonian. And so here she is out collecting a uh, wild grape in Virginia. And um, so she goes in the field and collects um, she maintains, she's the curator of the herbarium at the Smithsonian, and then she does uh, the molecular work, meaning the work on the um, genetic material to see what's related to what. Because, of course, now we have a whole, a whole other uh, level of, we, botanists used to be able to look at the uh, features of the plant and put them in different um, taxonomic groups. But in this case, now they use molecular techniques as well. Um, so she, I just happened to mention, because here it calls it one name and she has recently renamed this particular vine. And I just want to mention this because um, my gardening friends find this very frustrating because taxonomists do this, they change the names. And um, it's really important to do this though. It's important, I think it's important to know about our great, amazing um, evolutionary shrub, as they call it these days, um, and how we're all related to each other. But um, it's very important, for example, for conservation, because if you know that this is actually a separate species, then you, you need to know how much of that species you need to maintain in a gene bank. Um, and so that's why it's, it's, it's important to do the taxonomy, and that's why the names seem to be always changing if you're working in the plant nursery trade or a gardener. Um, just a little bit more about stuff that came out of the workshop. So this is um, the results of what's called gap analysis, which is basically a way of trying to see has the genetic diversity of this particular wild plant been sufficiently captured both in um, gene banks and in the wild, and where are the gaps where more collecting of this um, species is needed or more protecting in protected areas. And like any workshop or conference, um, some of the most exciting stuff is really the stuff that happens outside of, of the lectures. 
And um, I really love to see the synergy. Um, this again is uh, June Wen, the taxonomist at the Smithsonian. And this is Lucy Morton. Um, some of you watching this talk may know Lucy. She's a world renowned viticulturalist and um, and a vineyard consultant uh, in, and she lives in Charlottesville. And here she is looking at a um, vine that's at Oak Spring. Um, this old vine that no, they didn't know what it was and, and how to maintain it. And um, Lucy was looking at it here, trying to figure out, you know, what, what it was. I loved it that Lucy and June were here together looking at it, really using their expertise. They both come with this incredible expertise and it's really exciting to see it come together because of June. Of course, June looks at the um, leaves and things in the field, but she also does the molecular work Whereas Lucy is an ampelographer, which means that she goes by the leaf shape and the other vine characteristics. And she's an expert. On, she's written books about how to identify vines. Um, and then um, the people at Oak Spring actually found some uh, wine in their basement that of this particular building that was um, that um, was made by uh, Bunny Mellon, Paul Mellon's wife. Uh, in 1975, so that was kind of fun. We did not drink that though. Um, and anyway, this is just uh, Lucy consulting with the biocultural farm staff at Oak Spring, um, telling them, um, tell, telling her about the um, what she thinks the vine is and how they should go about conserving it. So I, I really think that kind of thing is fun. Um, just a little bit about um, our local grapes, and this is a great resource. I've linked this in my um, the WordPress site that I gave you the link to, and so this will tell you. Um, and actually, getting back to that person's question, now that I'm looking at it, looks like if you found Vitus labresca, it would have a pretty large grape fruit. So. Um, yeah, I guess it could range to be that large, which to me is as large as what I would think of it as a domesticated one. The muscadine, of course, is a little different because, um, well, they, they are just larger, rounder grapes. Um, and uh, I think there's some domestication that has happened in the muscadine. The muscadines are Vitus rotundifolia. They are now in the same um, genus as the, the, uh, the, all the rest of the grapes. Um, even though they have a different number of chromosomes than the other vitus grapes, but there can be some inter, I think there can be some interbreeding there. So here's a few others of ones you may be familiar with if you've ever looked into this, but um, this is a great resource. And then it's always, um, you know, I know many of you probably use the digital atlas of Virginia flora to tell you what some of the some of the ones nearby are Estevalis, Vitus ruparia. Here's Vitus rupestris again, which I've talked about. And it's just interesting because, of course, there's very few samples because it's not widespread. And um, some of the samples are in, actually in Great Falls National Park and in the D.C. area. Uh, this is just back to crop wild relatives in general. This was a study of 600 species, and this is just showing the um, number of taxa that are in different parts of the United States. So you can see here we're in a bit of a hot spot um, in our area of having a lot of crop wild relatives. And there's a uh, iNaturalist page on crop wild relatives. So it's it's a passive page. So if you take a picture of something that is a crop wild relative, it uh, gets put into this project. So it's not curated, but it is a good way to kind of keep track, um, you know, and scientists will use this information to find the ranges of things. And um, what I think is fascinating are just the crop wild relatives that are in the garden and in the nursery. And this is a, a wild relative of the squashes that I grow called Melothria. We actually sold it in the nursery that I work in this year. Um, and so it's, uh, I don't think it's domesticated, but it's a great little vegetable all the same. And um, great little fruit, sorry. And these are Jerusalem artichokes. Here's um, some wild um, tomatillo uh, relatives that we sell in the nursery I work in, which is uh, watermark woods in Hamilton. And then um, I really like looking in my yard for weeds that um, might be crop wild relatives. This, of course, is Queen Anne's lace. 
which is uh, which is the same um, species as the carrot, but uh, you can't eat Queen Anne's lace. But that just shows you how closely related these things could be. Oh, and these are um, uh, Solanum nightshade crop wild relatives, so probably related to the uh, tomatoes or the um, peppers. So um, these are some really interesting documentaries. Actually, this one's still in production, but this one, Vitus Prohibita, um, was uh, Lucy Morton is interviewed in it, and, uh, and now Lucy is working very hard on this one on the left. Um, if you want to know more about the um, French American um, hybrid grapes, uh, there's a fascinating story behind it. So I recommend this. The links are in the WordPress site there. Um, and so looking towards the future, actually, this is a fellow who came to that workshop I was telling you about. He's now working at the USDA station in Kearneysville, West Virginia, with a new mandate. Uh, it's a brand new job to breed uh, grapevines that are adapted to the mid-Atlantic United States. So um, that I think that's really exciting, and he was excited to be at our workshop. Um, so, you know, going forward, hopefully, uh, the it's possible to um, have less need for the sprays for pests and pathogens and adaptation to climate change, which of course is very important. Two of the major reasons for uh, crop wild relatives and for breeding those crop wild relatives into modern hybrids. And um, just on a personal note, I've actually um, kind of just enjoyed getting to know the hybrid grapes more and more, and that's something that you might enjoy doing too. This is um, from Zephaniah, which is um, a Loudoun County vineyard, and this is one of their, uh, this is, I think, Chardonnay. Um, and the Norton is actually, I should mention that, uh, a pretty famous hybrid. It's, uh, many people call it the sort of all-American grape. Uh, it's another one that uh, arose, it arose in Richmond, and um, I think from a seedling that had been a cross in the wild and then crossed back with uh, Vitus estivalis. And here is another Norton. This is at Stone from Stonehill Winery in Missouri. Um, and these are two of the most famous places where Norton grapes are planted. And uh, this Norton is from Chrysalis Vineyards, which is uh, across Route 50 from Loudoun County in, um, in the Middleburg area. And it's the largest planting of the Norton grape um, anywhere. And here's a picture of the Norton grape. And then here's a few other little um, hybrid uh, grapes from hybrid wines that I sort of enjoy. And I don't know, you know, I like to think it's a way of sort of supporting this this move forward. So yeah, there you have it. And I'm open to any questions that anybody has. We had a question about um, the conservation site. You mentioned the one for cranberries. Has there ever been a thought for having one for wild grapes is would that be a benefit do you think um yes there was and in fact i'm now wondering what happened to the slide that i had on that so um yes so oh yeah i did have that slide in there um the the vitus repestris there's um there was a suggestion in like the early 2000s to make a uh, reserve for Vitus repestris, especially uh, it was that woman in the picture with uh, with the vines um, on the front of a magazine. And um, she was behind this. She did a lot of work on it. She also had two other American vines that she wanted to have in reserves. She worked really hard on it. Um, nothing actually ever came of it yet, but I was actually asking a colleague today, um, whatever became of that. And she said, it's still something they're going to try to push for it at some point, at least for Vitus rupestris. But no, the answer is that's why I showed the cranberry and the, uh, wild yeah. tree, because those are the only, um, ones that I know of. Um, I think the ones that we have in North America. It seems like such an important, you know, kind of way to conserve our, you know, natural parks and natural land is keeping these, these, these native plants safe like that in, in natural, you know, national parks. So I, that was an important part. I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. We had yeah. we also had a question: um, how seedless grapes fit into the domestication of grapes? That um, the person was assuming that the native grapes aren't naturally seedless. 
Right. Um, yeah. Um, you know what? I don't know too much about how they breed for um, seedless fruit in general, but obviously they do that quite a bit in breeding. Um, yeah. If I've read about how that's done, I, I don't know. Okay. But obviously, yes, correct. None of the, um, as far as I know, a fruit wouldn't be seedless in the wild because the whole point of a fruit is to um, get the seed to a suitable place to um, sprout into a new plant. Okay, this this question's more. Um, I know you said you know you know professional winemaker, but what makes a wine grape a good wine grape? Is it the sugar content? Do you have, know anything about that? No, <laughs> those are the things I don't know anything about. <laughs> Here's worth asking. Someone did comment that they the, all the wines look amazing. You know, hear about the grapes and having all these local vineyards on the screen right now. We need to uh, send out a wine list program. <laughs> Yeah, um, I would love to. I'll, I can put some more things on my website where you can do some of this research on your own. Yeah. Even going to some of these Loudoun County and um, this these ones at Arendelle, um, um, Brie, Brie Day is um, the next county over. But yeah, I could put some links yeah. in there where you could do some more of this research on your own. People do <laughs> yeah. find it. To, people do find it a very different taste, and there's right. been a lot of negative things said over the years. Um, I really find I'm enjoying my exploration of the um, the hybrid wines, and yeah. um, you know, some, someone someone also had a comment about that. Do the hybrid wines have a unique flavor? Yes, it is a unique with... flavor. So, what I think is really curious, and I haven't, I don't know if I've gotten a great answer for this. You know, there's a thing about uh, American wines tasting foxy, and I believe they're talking about the ones that come from Labrusca, which would be like the Concord. Okay, but the Concord is also what they say is the classic grape flavor. So <laughs> it's if it, it's the classic grape flavor that we have in grape candy, but it's it's also the foxy flavor, which is considered a bad flavor. And I, I've been asking people what that's all about, and I don't know if there's a satisfactory answer. We had someone say they were surprised to hear that our table grapes and raisins are Vitis vinifera, and then also. Do you have any knowledge about Native Americans? Did they make wine from their local grapes and did they enjoy it? I wish I had more um, research on that um, because I don't have much and I don't think there's a whole lot out there. I did put a link in the WordPress site to a wonderful exhibition that happened at uh, Missouri Botanical Garden at the Shaw Museum there a couple years ago and they have wonderful resources and things to go along with that. And, and I specifically did s put something in there about the ethnobotanical uses okay. in the past. And then we had, um, looks like the last question, is there a difference between um, white and red when it comes to the native grapes? I don't know that either. I don't know too much about white wine <laughs> versus red wine. Actually, my my husband knows more about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I do not know. Okay, awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions. And like I said earlier, this will be available probably in the next 48 hours to watch on the Loudoun County Online Programs um, web channel on YouTube. So if you like this program, definitely recommend it to your friends and watch it because you know it's available for you so the people who couldn't make it live, just uh, yeah, give us a good word. And uh, thank you, Nan, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for showing up tonight. We appreciate you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.